All right. Hey, what's up, guys? Um, welcome to hopefully another great class, Fourth Amendment uh, class on good faith. But you guys know, if you've never been here before, right, Antoinette, if you've never been here before, you guys know that Blue to Gold has a no questions asked money back guarantee, right, for our free webinars. Just ask us if you don't like the content. We'll give your money back. In fact, we'll give, we'll double. We'll double your money back. All right. <laughs> so, guys, welcome. I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, this is a brand new webinar. We've next we've never done it before. And let's. Hey, Rick, do me a favor. Remind our friends here to send um, the their uh, comments to all attendees. There you go. See what Richard just said. So, my friend Shane, and uh, who else we got here? Let me adjust this camera real quick. My friend Shane and. Uh, and Matthew from Ohio, do me a favor, uh, make sure your chat settings and Timothy and so forth say to all attendees and so forth. All right. <laughs> See, Joseph, Joseph, you actually, you might be on to something, but the first, Joseph, if uh, the, the first shirt that I'm going to have is right to be, right to see, right? That's, that's the first one I'm going to make because that's a, that's a catchy little saying. <laughs> <laughs> the t-shirt all right guys i love it we're gonna have some fun so please 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 make sure that your chat settings say panelists and attendees right otherwise nobody can can see it hey rick hey rick let's get that on the books right for the the marketing committee over at blue to gold let's get those t-shirts in the mix because i know some people want to buy those some of those those clever right right to be right to see change the facts, change the answer. We got to come up with some like, some funny, like, you know, okay, we, we can do this. We can actually make the law kind of fun. Yeah. Piffy. That's not even a word, Rick. You're just making that stuff. We'll put that on a t-shirt too. All right. Let me, uh, do we have some, uh, some, some new peeps here? We got some, some, uh, some officers that have never been to my training before. Anybody? Mm-hmm. All right, cool. All right, Jessica, welcome. All right, we got we got a, we got a, we got a few new ones. All right. Yeah, and um and Jared, you know what? I think that's that's a that's a mobile a mobile thing, guys. My name is Anthony Bandiero. I'm an attorney and senior legal instructor for Blue to Gold Law Enforcement Training. Um, this is what I do for a living. I have the honor and the privilege to train cops all around the nation in search and seizure. So, I was a a full time cop in Las Vegas. I was with uh. Nevada DPS. Hey, actually, uh, my mother, who loves these videos, by the way, she's, she has another suggestion, a, a T-shirt with not, not my pants. Here's what I want to do. Actually, I have an idea for that T-shirt. I want to have a T-shirt with a fake belt line with a methamphetamine baggie coming out of it. And then, like, like you know, like you can actually see the meth, the meth bag coming out of it, and then it says, officer, these are not my pants, right? <laughs> <laughs> that actually rick hey rick you gotta write that one down too that's a good one that's it oh rick don't like that one that's a good one all right see he don't get it rick rick was never a cop he never he never he doesn't get it how funny that is like cops get that almost every day so um this is what i do i love doing these uh these uh these free webinars i do them every week and hey we are working on another webinar in the mornings right so we should have a schedule up very soon for a morning webinar at some, you know, during the week and a night webinar like this one. So, so you guys that are having problems getting to me, um, you know, late at night, cause right, like right now it's what it's, uh, you know, eight o'clock for my friends in the East coast. Right. So, um, we'll, we're going to fix that. We got you, Micah. We got you. So let's continue now. Um, just so you know, I am traveling this week. I'm in, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, um, uh, Maricopa County has sponsored our training man what a what a great class sold out waiting list uh for our class great hosts great cops um some of the stuff i'm hearing down here is kind of crazy though you know arizona has uh man it's it's I'm, they're it's you know cops have it hard everywhere right i mean arizona usually is um yeah I, isaac next time isaac next time right hey catherine what's up catherine is my my phoenix cop i got a lot of your uh brother and sister in that class too um, but I'll be back. So in, in Phoenix, and then uh, I'm going to uh, Boston, 
right? I'm going to Boston next week. And uh, Rick will tell you where we're going after that. But please, if you can join us for one of our live classes, please do. <laughs> All right. So consider if you don't have this book or you got feedback about the book, good or bad or indifferent, you know, let us know. But, you know, this book, The Search and Seize Survival Guide, is I'm proud to say the best selling book in, um, you know, uh, you know, for law enforcement. Hey, what's up, Phil? Phil's from Boston. Hey, make sure you uh, change your settings to all attendees. And um, if you got this book, hopefully it's helping you do your job. My goal in life is this. Here's what I want for you. I want you to make good case law and I want you to be legally safe, right? I want you to end every shift without any worry about losing your home, going to jail or anything like that. I want you to be legally safe. You gotta be, le I want to help you make good case law too, right guys? All right. All right, disclaimers before we start, right? That's awesome. Thanks, Catherine. I appreciate that. There's, a, there's an Arizona version coming out too, but it's, I'll just tell you, it's very similar to the one you have already. But there is a, a little Arizona version. At least it'll have the cover, right? This will have the cover of Arizona. So laws and agency SOPs may be more restrictive. Guys, just remember that I'm talking about things about, you know, the Constitution and, and so forth, right? If you have any doubts about the legality of your actions, push it up the chain right? This is not the time to have uncertainty about what you're doing out there. Your legal survival depends on you knowing what the law is, at least the, the, the parts that you can know. Some stuff is uncertain, right? And then finally, this course is legal education, not legal advice. Okay. We will email you a cert, right? We will email you a cert. And, um, just make sure, though, you please, 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 you know, check your, um, your your spam folder, junk mail folder, and so forth, and make sure that it hasn't gone in there before you contact us. Um, but if you do not get your cert by tomorrow, I'm going to give you an email address for our wonderful person who handles this type of stuff. So, Herman, do me a favor. You see that email address I just gave you? Email her and ask her for your cert. Just remind her what class you went to, the date, and we'll take care of you, right? Email Terry, we'll take care of you. All right. All right, let's see who's here. Okay, let's, uh, let's see who's here. So let's first, good, all right, Herman. Okay, guys, let's, this is a test to see if you, you can follow instructions and let's see who's here. First, I want you to verify your chat settings say all panelists and attendees, right? Just make sure that they, and usually in blue, right? It says panelists and attendees. Otherwise, if it says panelists, here's the news. Nobody can see it. Next, I want you to type your agency and your state, but do not send it. Agency, state, and don't send it. <laughs> all right. Jason, check your chat settings, by the way. Three, two, one, send it. Man, we got some great agencies here. You know, the Department of Insurance in California is like almost always on my webinars. I just want to acknowledge you guys. Like, that's cool. I'm glad you guys are always here. You're always supporting the cause. All right, man, this is great. This is great. We got Oregon. We got Kansas. We got Nevada, sunny Nevada, the great state of Nevada, Louisiana. And of course, Cal Kern County, California is great. Virginia, Idaho, Utah, Ohio, uh, Massachusetts, uh, a lot of California. Rhode Island's in the house. Warwick. Oh, that's awesome. I love Warwick. North Carolina, Nebraska, New Mexico, uh, Wisconsin, Florida, New York, uh, uh, Hawaii is in the house. Colorado is definitely in the house. The U.S. Um, uh, Forest and uh, Wildlife Service is in the house, right? Uh, Texas is in the house, and uh, and awesome. That's great. Pennsylvania and uh, Tennessee, awesome guys. Glad you're here. Iowa, Iowa just had some bad case law come out, by the way. Oh man, Air and Arizona, of course, is in the house. All right, what's up, Philip? All right, good. So I just so you know. I see a lot of you guys are still not sending uh, your setting your 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 things to all people. I understand it. It's kind of I wish I wish Zoom made it more uh, right better. But uh, my friend Philip and 
uh, and Mandy and, and so forth and Frank and hey, Zachy, it's good to have you back, my friend. So uh, David from Oregon, just because you guys know. All right, guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about good faith. And then we're going to talk about bad faith, objective reasonableness, pretext stops, community caretaking. We got a, um, a lot to talk about, a little time to do it in. Let's, hey, as the great Officer Tatum says, let's get into this. If you're not following his channel, you got to. Another Arizona cop that retired and became a YouTube star, um, Officer Tatum. Um, all right. So good faith. All right. The reason, the reason I bring up, right? Yeah, B Tatum. Is it is it Brandon or is it it's not is it Brandon? I think it's a little different than that, but it's Brandon Tatum, I think. Uh, great guy. All right. So the reason I'm even having this this webinar is because a lot of cops misuse the phrase good faith, right? They misuse the, the phrase good faith. They a lot of cops, you know, understandably think that they will be okay in court, civilly being civilly sued or their criminal cases and so forth, that they will be okay if they have good faith. As long as they thought they were being reasonable and they were being and they acted in good faith and not trying to violate people's rights, they will be okay. Guys, that is not true, right? That is not true. Let's kind of go through it. That's not necessary. I shouldn't say it, that's not necessarily true. Good faith is a little more complicated than that. So basically, a general rule here is that good faith is intended to save evidence when the officers acted reasonably. That's the key word here on the, uh, on the belief that they acted legally. But basically, what good faith, right? Good faith will not save you. Hey, David, are you talking about one of my classes? Finish the line. Good faith will not save you, but bad faith will fill in the blank. <laughs> if you're taking my class before, <laughs> I love it. Um, Oh, <laughs> David, you make a search and seize your father proud. You've grown up so big and strong. That's very true. All right. So essentially reasonable means <laughs> that something external guided the officer's actions. I want you to think about it. Good faith is not necessarily that in your heart, you felt that you're doing the right thing. No. Um, instead, we judge those things by objective reasonableness. Instead, good faith applies when you're doing something because the outside world is telling you to do it. Generally, um, that looks like three things. Now, I want you to know that several states do not follow all of these good faith exceptions, okay? Cops that we have here, Connecticut, Georgia, Idaho, North Carolina, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, Pennsylvania, Vermont, and Massachusetts. They don't necessarily follow these under state law. Now, if you got sued under federal law, it would apply. So it's important that you guys are here. Don't think to yourself, oh man, I'm from Massachusetts. Um, good faith doesn't apply. Good faith doesn't apply to state cases, but it could save you in federal court. So stick around, it's still worth your time. All right, generally speaking, these are the three good faith exceptions, okay? defective search warrants, invalid arrest warrants, and unconstitutional laws, right? So let's talk about defective search warrants. So the basic rule here is that good faith will apply when officers reasonably, that's the key word, right? When officers reasonably rely on a judicially approved search warrant, though technically defective, right? It's, it's defective. The search warrant is invalid. There's something wrong with it. However, you are still reasonable. So let me give you an example. A magistrate issued a warrant for narcotics and evidence for a homicide. However, here's the problem. There was no probable cause for narcotics. Now he promised the cop, he says, you know what? I, I know there's a problem here because the cop um, the cop mistakenly left in language about narcotics in, in the search warrant, but there's no probable cause for it. The judge recognized that and actually promised to fix it. But the warrant was never corrected. They still served it with that language for narcotics. Will good faith apply? Yes or no. And the court found that yes, right? 
because the officers reasonably relied on the warrant, evidence was not suppressed. So they reasonably relied on this judge telling them that he's going to fix it. That makes sense. And why should we penalize our police officers when they go get a warrant? The judge tells them, hey, I'll fix it. We'll get this all squared away. Don't worry. And the judge still doesn't fix it. That is not there's no deterrent effect there. There's no reason to suppress the evidence to basically teach the cops a lesson. There's no lesson to be learned except listening to your judge, right? Here's another example. Example: A defendant claimed that the affidavit was invalid. Now, during the warrant application, the judge inquired about probable cause. So what I want to teach you here is something called the four corners rule. Has anybody ever heard of the four corners rule? Right. When you're writing search warrants, my detectives and my lawyers on here, right? We maybe have some attorneys on here and so forth. My, yep. Right. Bert has heard of it. Right. So the four corners rule is basically the rule that everything in the, the affidavit is going to determine probable cause. In other words, you can't use something that that the cops know, but do not put into the four corners of the warrant. If it's not in the affidavit, it doesn't count. However, here is a good faith exception. If the judge asks you a question and inquires about something and you tell him or her about it and they, they include that in their probable cause information, then it falls under good faith. However, you can imagine the problem, right? This is a close call because in order for this to work, the judge is going to have to remember the conversation, right? You guys hear, right? If the judge does not remember the conversation, then, you know, you may be out of luck here. So luckily the judge did remember the conversation and, and so forth, but with busy judges, big courthouses and so forth, maybe the judge just says, yeah, I guess I, I talked to him about some stuff, but I'm not sure what, then the four corners rule uh, is in effect. Now, the judge's probable cause inquiries contribute to PC, and therefore, good faith applies. That just makes sense. Why penalize the cops over this one? It is the magistrate's responsibility to determine whether the officer's allegations establish probable cause, and if so, to establish a warrant comporting in form with the requirements of the Fourth Amendment. In the ordinary case, an officer cannot be expected to question the magistrate's probable cause determination or his judgment that the form of the warrant is technically sufficient. Penalizing the officer for the magistrate's error rather than his own cannot logically contribute to the deterrence of Fourth Amendment violations, right? Record, Casey, record asking, uh, record conversation. Um, I would not <laughs> record a judge's conversation without his or her express approval. So tell your friend, you better have that express approval because if that judge does not like being recorded, you are probably going to have some bad day. <laughs> They'll find some reason. <laughs> I love it. All right. So here's another one. The search warrant failed to include the address of the defendant. However, the officer who wrote the warrant was on scene and directed it. So he knew what the address was. The correct house was search. <laughs> Good faith. The court also found good faith. Playing with fire, absolutely. If the wrong house was hit, you're going to get, you're going to probably, you're going to pay money on. Um, you know, it's just a reality. If the cop who, if the cop, who, you know, who wrote the affidavit wasn't on scene, uh, maybe no good faith, right? But these are close calls. But the, 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 the point here is, you know, these are mistakes, right? These are mistakes. So, and Mandy's also saying illegal in some states. That's correct. Even a private conversation. Now, usually phone calls are, you know, what they're talking about. But in some states, you can't even record a private conversation without their consent. Um, so that would be another another problem. That's thanks, Mandy. I appreciate that too. So the reason, look, in order to understand good faith, it's like, is there a deterrent effect? You know, um, did something from the outside world tell the cop to do it? Yes, a warrant. And are we penalizing this, this officer and going to get anything out of it? And the answer, the court said no in this, this court. Now, finally, a, um, a judge incorrectly signed the affidavit. 
and not the search warrant. So imagine, so basically this guy was like, uh, you know, sleepy eyed, probably two o'clock in the morning. He put his signature on the affidavit thinking that that was the warrant and the cops hit the house, searched it. Should we penalize this co these cops? Right. Do you think, or actually I'll answer this, i ask it this way. Should get good faith apply here? Yes or no? Should good faith apply to these, these cops? The cop, the, the judge says, yeah, go for it. Signs the wrong form. Right. Exactly. That's the whole point. There's what we get nothing out of penalizing these cops, right? We get nothing out of penalizing these cops. Okay, good. Now, good faith will even save search warrants that have at least arguable probable cause. Okay, guys. So I teach, you know, search and seizure and a lot of warrantless stuff. Basically, the rule is, is that if you do a search or seizure without a warrant, you don't get any breaks, right? You don't get any breaks. Um, if you mess up, you're going to have to pay for it, right? You're going to have to pay for it. But the rule is more lenient when the officer got a warrant. And even if the court finds that there was no probable cause, they call this arguable probable cause. This is incredible. A search warrant for enticing a minor was defective and not supported by probable cause. However, the officer was not reckless or dishonest and objectively believed that probable cause existed, even though, strictly speaking, it did not. But still, the judge signed off on it, right? Good faith applied. That is incredible. I want you to think about it. That could never happen with warrantless searches. If you search something without a warrant, even though, let's say, the motor vehicle exception, and the court found later you do not have probable cause, you're going to lose your evidence, even though you had good faith, right? Uh, because good faith doesn't apply to those situations. It's objective reasonableness. Next, invalid arrest warrants. This makes sense. Something from the outside world is telling you to do what you did. So good faith applies when officers uh, rely on an arrest warrant, though later found to be defective. Cops arrested a suspect based on arrest warrant and found drugs search incident to arrest. Cops later learned that due to a clerical error, error the warrant was invalid. In fact, it should have been pulled 17 days ago. Should we penalize the officer? Should we penalize the evidence? Should we suppress the evidence to teach this cop a lesson? And the answer is no, right? What are we going to get from this? What is this cop? This cop doesn't know. He, he or she has no reason to believe that this warrant is invalid. So therefore, there is no deterrent effect under the exclusionary rule. And it's a defense for 1983 as well. Now, if the suspect can prove that there's systemic um, negligence and recklessness at the courthouse and that the, 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 um, the records clerk is sleeping on the job and not pulling warrants when they need to be, maybe that's a different story, right? If we were indeed, a, uh, if it were indeed a court clerk who was responsible for the erroneous entry on the police computer, application of the exclusionary rule also could not be expected to alter the behavior of the arresting officer. As the trial court in this case stated, I think the police officer was bound to arrest. I think he would have been derelict in his duty if he failed to arrest. So there, remember, that's what good faith is all about, right? It's all about something external telling you to do what you did, and then there's no deterrent effect to penalize you. Now, some courts will suppress the evidence if there is evidence of gross misconduct or long-term negligence in the court database, something else to teach, you know, basically teach the whole court system a lesson that you just can't just be sleeping on the job and expect evidence to still come in. Now, the final one for good faith is unconstitutional or ambiguous laws, right? Okay, first, there is no deterrent rationale in penalizing police for enforcing a law that is later found to be unconstitutional. Many laws out there have been found to be unconstitutional and the courts and the cops have been enforcing them. And if the suspect wants to turn around 
and sue the police officer for a false arrest for enforcing that law. Very tough. There is there is one relief valve, but but very, very tough because cops are not responsible for judging the constitution, generally speaking, the con the constitutionality, uh, constitutionality of judges or or, uh, or um, laws or policies. However, there is an exception for grossly obvious in constitutional laws. Okay, so here's an example. Illinois law gave officers unbridled discretion to warrantly search junkyards and parts dealers for criminal activity. So they can go into AutoZone, they can go into the junkyard, and they can just search people's stuff and search, you know, for evidence of VIN uh, alterations and all this kind of stuff. And that is just not quite constitutional, right? The, uh, the administrative search exception is more tailored than that, right? Now, three stolen vehicles were discovered. Should we penalize the police officers for this when they were acting under color, uh, under the color of law and, and the, the statute and so forth? And the U.S. Supreme Court said, no, not here. The exclusionary rule didn't apply since reliance on the statute was objectively reasonable. They had no reason to believe that it was blatantly unconstitutional. Junkyards are highly regulated businesses, just like gun stores, liquor establishments, um, my, my wildlife cops on here, uh, hunting and fishing is a highly regulated business. They get to do a lot of things that are intrusive that regular uh, street cops cannot do to other people and so forth. So that's the logic here. Even though the law was written unconstitutionally and applied unconstitutionally, there's no incentive to penalize these cops. Another example, a stop and identify statute was held unconstitutional. However, the search incident to arrest discovered narcotics. The, the defendant wanted the evidence suppressed. Well, since the ordinance was presumptively valid, cops had good faith and the evidence was not suppressed. Look, generally speaking, unless it's very obvious that what you are doing is unconstitutional, they should not hold you liable and suppress your evidence for doing your job. That's generally, the, the, the you know, um, these are close calls, and there is a presumptive of a reliability uh, of constitutionality when your legislature has passed a law for you to enforce. I mean, the legislature has attorneys, there's courts involved. I mean, they presume that they're doing their job too. Police are charged to enforce laws until and unless they are declared unconstitutional. The enactment of a law forecloses speculation by enforcement officers concerning its constitutionality. With the possible exception, hold on, of a law so grossly and flagrantly unconstitutional that any person of reasonable prudence would be bound to see its flaws. Society would be ill-served if its police officers took it upon themselves to determine which laws are and which laws and which are not constitutionally entitled to enforcement. They're not going to put that into your hands. You guys are not the lawyers, the judges, the legislature. You know, that's just not your job. Your job is law enforcement. Still, I mean, I mean, I'm just telling you what the law is, but, you know, let's use some good discretion too, right? I mean, sometimes um, I'm asked questions by my students about certain things and about, you know, disorderly conduct and, you know, arresting people because they pissed off the police, um, you know. Even if it's not clear whether it's constitutional, you should be making good case law, right? People should be arrested and cited for legitimate purposes, not because they copped an attitude with you or your partner, right? So we want to use good discretion. Now, the, this doctrine also applies to case law that is later overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court. So the, the point here is that if you have a, um, a, a circuit case, right, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has said, hey, this is... Um, you know, lawful in our jurisdiction. You can, cops can do this. And then the U.S. Supreme Court says, uh, time out, Ninth, Ninth Circuit. No, that is not lawful. Now the, 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 the defendant wants to get his evidence suppressed because now the U.S. Supreme Court is on his side. Well, generally speaking, um, the cop can be the... Def <laughs> David asked about Lang versus California. Let me, let me talk about that. So, well, let me finish this case and I'll talk about just Lang real quick. 
A cop automatically searched a suspect's car as a search incident to arrest. Now, this was later held unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court in a case called Arizona versus Gantt, right? However, you know, as the guy was appealing his case, Arizona versus Gantt came out and he says, ah, see, when the cops searched my car, it was unconstitutional because the U.S. Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional. I want the evidence suppressed. Well, generally speaking, these cases are not retroactive, right? People that are currently in the court system and at the time that the police officer was, was, was doing the search, uh, court, court cases actually upheld what he was doing. So even though it was later proved unconstitutional, not going to work. Now, let's see if I have a, okay. So um, David brings up uh, Lang versus California. Now Lang versus California briefly is uh, a case that just came out uh, today or yesterday. I forget exactly when, but um, it's a very momentous case. It basically, what happened there is a, is a chippy in, in California Fall just, you know, was trying to pull this guy over for uh, a loud music violation, you know, loud um, sound violation, you know, bumping music and so forth. The guy claims he didn't see uh, CHP trying to pull him over. He pulls into his driveway, shuts the garage door. The cop puts his foot into the um, into the laser beam, you know, the light, the sensor. The garage goes up, ends up arresting this guy for for uh, DUI. And the question is, can you? In, in, engage in hot pursuits um, with a suspected misdemeanor suspect. Now, I will tell you that I thought that the U.S. Supreme Court was going to uphold this. I, I really did. I just thought that they were going to give a bright line rule that, you know, kind of like they did in some other cases where, look, you know, cops are acting under the heat of the moment. It may not be fair. Um, it, it may not be fa uh, fair to penalize the cop for trying to get this, if this guy, you know, if it's a restful offense. Now, that's one thing I did not know about in, in California. Well, no, he's a, let's say he's hot pursuit. So he's obstructing, you know, PC 148. So, okay. Um, so I thought they would say that it's an, if it's an arrestable offense, misdemeanor or not, you know, misdemeanor or felony, that you could chase them into the house and the Supreme Court. I have not read the case yet. I, I got to read it, but I've been, you know, teaching this week. Um, I haven't seen it yet and I'm doing this webinar, but. I'm surprised they want a, they want a factors test. They want, look, what's, if there's anybody in harm, any evidence that can be uh, destroyed is any, you know, uh, the, 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 can you reasonably get a warrant? So, yeah. So basically right now, Catherine, if you're chasing somebody for a misdemeanor and they get into their home and there's no other thing going on and you feel that, you, you know, you can get a, go get a warrant, surround and go get a warrant. It appears that the Supreme Court wants you to, to just back off and go get that warrant. Um, yes, but I, I have not read the case and I will do a video on it. In fact, maybe our next uh, webinar will be a, a will change it to that that case. And there's a there's a couple other cases that, that have come out too. We probably should talk about. Um, yeah. So David basically says you got to have exigency, and and usually you probably won't have it. This is what the. Okay, gotcha. Thanks, Mark. And Mark maybe might add some other stuff in there too. Um, is Juan says, is there a way around Gantt searches, a way to still search a car incident to arrest? Yes. There's two ways. Okay. One is the person is arrested near the vehicle, unrestrained while you search it. How often will that happen? <laughs> you ain't doing that. So that's one. That's not going to happen. That's not realistic. Um, Here's the other one. You have reason to believe offense related evidence is inside the vehicle. Right? Not probable cause, but reason to believe is closer to reasonable suspicion. You have reason to believe, if you want to write this down, you have reason to believe offense related evidence is inside the vehicle. So, for example, if you if you arrest somebody for DUI and you can articulate that you believe intoxicants, drugs, bar receipts or whatever can be inside that vehicle to help prove your case, then you can go in there and search it. Casey says inventory search before the vehicle towed. 
Well, yes, but remember that not all states say that you can tow a vehicle post DUI. Some states require a tow and other states say that, hey, um, if somebody else is inside the car and can drive it away safely, let them have it. So that would be a problem for the inventory search. Okay, David, I have, David, interesting. I have not seen it, that case. So you're saying that they think that there's probably agency nine out, nine out of 10 times? Cool. Nice. Yep, 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 awesome. Now, good faith may also apply to highly ambiguous statute. Okay, cool. David, I can't wait to read it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now, um, James says it can drive away the motor vehicle exception. Actually, uh, you know, just, the, the, just because, just so you can clarify, you know, just because the car can be driven away, just because the car is mobile is not exigency. Um, that is an old school way of looking at the motor vehicle exception, but today... The, 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 the motor vehicle exception is mostly based on not really exigency, but a reduced expectation of privacy. So that's, you know, if you guys got the, the cars mobile, you got the keys, the guys in the back of the car, uh, well, you know, it's just, well, I think that doesn't really apply, I guess. Um, probable cause such as open containers in plain view. Yeah, well, that would be probable cause. But remember, Gantt says you can also have a reason to believe. Now, as far as these good faith goes with statutes, I want ambiguous statutes. Strictly speaking, it's not good faith. It's not really what they would call it. It's just reasonableness. It's what they would call a reasonable mistake of law. So there's two types of mistakes that cops you know, make. Um, reasonable mistake of law and, and reasonable mistake of fact, right? So I got an example, right? Um, a cop came up to me today and said... Um, he said he arrested this homeless person because they had a gun and they were a felon. And on the gun, it said 20, that was like a little 22 caliber rifle. And when he, so, you know, search into arrest, we found drugs and all this other stuff. And they took him to jail. And when they started messing with the, the gun and like kind of like getting ready for, you know, to put into evidence, they realized that the gun was altered to look like a real gun. It actually was a BB gun. So there was no violation of the felon in possession. And he asked me, am I okay? Was that a lawful arrest? And I said, yes, because that was a reasonable mistake of fact, right? You were mistaken. In fact, that was not a firearm under legal definition. However, he made it look like a re real firearm. He put a barrel, I know, barrel on, he covered it up with a, with a real wood stock from a 22. That's on him, right? Even though it was a BB gun. Uh, but you were reasonable. Reasonable stake of law is a little different. This is where you think something is illegal, but it's really not. Let me give you an example. A cop from Chicago um, laterals to an agency in Texas. And he's on his job and he's, you know, he pulls this guy over and the guy has a BB gun and an airsoft gun, right? And he's like, and the guy's a felon. Now, this may or may not be a, a, a violation in Texas. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think it is. But the guy's a felon. And he says, oh, this guy can't have a BB gun or an airsoft gun because, you know, that's illegal. He's a felon. He's thinking in terms of Chicago law, right? Well, in, in Texas, let's say it's not illegal. He, he arrests him. Would that be a reasonable mistake of law? No. He, he charged him with an improper crime. He should have known better that this is Texas, not Chicago. An officer incorrectly believed that vehicles required two stop lamps, not one. So this car had a, uh, one of the tail lamps was out. He pulled it over. One thing leads to another. We find evidence. Are we good? Well, the U.S. Supreme Court found that even though this was a mistake of law, the way that the statute was written actually allowed somebody to have one stop lamp. You know, like think about like those old school Model Ts, right? They have like little, uh, uh, they have a, uh, a license plate, a, a tail light just on one side, right? And you have to use hand signals. Well, that's what the law was kind of written for, for those old school cars. It wasn't updated for modern cars. And the cop didn't know that. He thought it was illegal for both. And the Supreme Court found that that was a reasonable mistake, evidence not suppressed. 
However, if the law is blatantly, if it blatantly violates the Constitution, right, it's just so facially invalid, the evidence may be suppressed despite good faith, right? So federal law permitted um, warrantless and suspicionless vehicle searches of any car within a reasonable distance from the border. So that's what the federal law said, just at reasonable distance. Well, the AG defined reasonable distance as 100 air miles from the border. So if you stopped a car 100 air miles from the border, you could just search it under the, the border exception. Does that sound reasonable to you? Do you think that if your boss told you, hey, you can search any car that's within 100 miles of the U.S. border for no reason at all, you would think that that was reasonable, <laughs> right? So the, the, the U.S. Supreme Court found that that blatantly violated the Fourth Amendment, right? And the cops are not going to get good faith on that one. All right, bad faith. I put bad faith in quotes because strictly speaking, it may not be bad faith that they call this, but you know, you have good faith and you just have some bad faith. Let's talk about some bad faith. Good faith doesn't apply if a reasonable officer would know the warrant or the statute, that's a misspelling, right, was obviously lacking in illegality, right? <laughs> Undocumented faith. <laughs> well, that's funny, actually. All right. So here is the, the three things that we see in cases. Number one is lies and reckless information or a biased judge. A judge is not neutral and detached. And number three, the warrant is facially invalid. No cop should have known that this thing was legit. All right. Lies and reckless information. So a warrant is invalid if it contained intentional false statements or information made with reckless disregard for the truth. So here's the rule. If a cop intentionally added false information, it's invalid as almost as, a, um, as, a, as, as, a, as an automatic. Even if you take out that false information and uh, those lies and the, the, the warrant still had probable cause. Normally, courts will not even allow the warrant to succeed at all. Now, if a cop was made a mistake and put some information in a, in a search warrant that was not correct, like so, for example, uh, cases where cops have had affidavits where I, I got a little lazy and I, I left in some prior information regarding another suspect, right? And I, I just maybe use like a template, right? And um, and that got in my warrant. If that's called a Frank's hearing, right? So if you go to a Frank's hearing and uh, you know the court believes that that was an honest mistake, here's what they will do: they will excise that information out. Then they will reread the warrant, and if they find arguable probable cause, meaning you know would a, would, a, would an officer reasonably believe that there's probable cause here, right? You know, if you find arguable probable cause then the warrant is still valid. But here, if the court believes you intentionally did it, then it violates all other kinds of rules. And it doesn't matter if there's probable cause, you're going to lose. There's also this idea that if cops are so reckless, so lazy investigation, um, the, 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 it's clear that somebody else committed the crime, but they're still chasing after this other dude because they, they just, they don't, they don't want to be like, no, I can't be wrong. I know that guy is the, is the culprit, but all the signs are pointed to somebody else and they're reckless, then the, uh, the, uh, the warrant could also be invalid. Now, deference to the magistrate, however, is not boundless, right? Deference meaning showing the, the magistrate some respect. I mean, he or she is, right, your gatekeeper for these warrants, right? It is clear, first, that the deference accorded to a magistrate's finding of probable cause does not preclude inquiry into the knowing or reckless falsity of the affidavit on which that determination was based. This is your U.S. versus uh, Leon case. This is your main go-to case, right? My attorneys here, they know this case because it's been mentioned in probably countless suppression hearings. 
Leon, right? That is your whole idea about um, the deference to a, a magistrate and so forth, right? Indeed, it would be unthinkable imposition upon the magistrate's authority if a warrant affidavit revealed after the fact to contain a deliberately or recklessly false statement were to stand beyond impeachment. In other words, it ain't going anywhere. It's dead. You got the cop lied, got caught, pulled the wool over the, uh, the magistrate's eyes. There's no way that the court is going to reward that officer with the fruits of that search, even if, you know, the search could have been upheld otherwise with that false. They're not going to reward that cop. That's bad behavior, and the cop is going to be penalized in the court and obviously for Brady, right? Um, the cop will most likely not be a law enforcement officer if that's true. Now, bad faith may not apply if the officer writing the warrant is unaware of the false information. So I won't let you know. I know cops are thinking out there, but Anthony, I depend on other people to help me put in evidence in my warrant. I mean, what if this cop tells me that, um, you know, John, he saw Johnny make a hand-to-hand -hand drug transaction last Friday, and I put that in my report, in my affidavit, but we find out later, this is a complete lie that the officer that told me that was actually on vacation in Disneyland at the time, and he was just making it up because he doesn't like this dude. And he wants to go and, and go into his house and search it. Will I be in trouble? No, right? Unless you had reason to believe he was lying to you, right? But the answer is no. So only it applies to that guy, but not you. Um, in fact, uh, strictly speaking, most courts would probably excise that information because you were innocent. You didn't know what you were doing and, and just give you the benefit of the doubt and then go after the cop who lied for perjury and so forth. Maybe not perjury. That might be a little strict, um, but uh, IA and so forth. In Leon, the Supreme Court held that evidence obtained pers uh, pursuant to an ultimately invalidated search warrant should not be excluded where the officers executed the warrant with, the, with an objectively reasonable good faith reliance on the issuing judicial officer's determination of probable cause. In order for Leon to apply this whole good faith thing, right, we must conclude that an objectively reasonable officer could have believed that the information contained in the affidavit supporting the search warrant had been lawfully obtained. So as long as the cop thinks that his partners are giving him good information, even if proved later to be reckless or lying, that cop should not be penalized bias judge so good faith doesn't apply if the judge is quote holy if the judge wholly abandoned his judicial role in issuing the warrant if the judge is basically a rubber stamp judge uh we should not allow um those warrants to succeed if the judge is not neutral and detached the judge has a um a, a skin in the game somehow that judge is warrant should not uh, stand. You know, so for example, if the judge, if the judge's wife has a business, let's say a car wash, right? And the cops come to the judge and say, hey, we think that ABC car wash is laundering money. Now, ABC car wash is a com the, the direct competitor to his wife's, his wife's um, car wash. And he never says anything. He doesn't recuse himself and say, look, I can't, you know, I know that these people, they're our competitors, you know, and doesn't do, and then signs the warrant. And then the, the cops hit it and the guy goes out of business. And now, you know, the wife's car wash is number one in town and so forth. Uh, that's a problem, right? That is not a neutral and detached magistrate. Let me give you an example of, of, a, of a old school case that um, checked out this one. This one's going to be kind of funny. A town judge authorized a general warrant, very like indescript, right? Just like go seize everything, right? Type, type. That's what they mean by general warrant. To seize obscene materials and also participate in the search in order to watch pornography to help determine whether there was, they were obscene under law. <laughs> so this is a pornography case in New York City, right? And, um, well, not New York City necessarily, outside in, in New York. And I'm laughing here because, this judge is offering his services to go with the cops on this raid. And he, he, he actually literally went into the little theater inside the, the, uh, the adult store and watched these films and was telling the cops, 
This one's obscene. Nah, this one's okay. This one's obscene. Um, okay. <laughs> that sounds legit, Judge. <laughs> okay, right? You perv, <laughs> right? You, you perv? Come on. That's not legit, right? So the judge abandoned his independent role. The Supreme Court struck that down. You cannot have judges in the middle of, of cases, right? They are the ones on the outside looking in, right? <laughs> I mean, seriously, right, Herman? Maybe the cops should have been like, uh, judge, you sure this is like, you know, this is our business. You know, what about me, judge? I want to have my fun too. No. So um, you, you can't have judges involved, uh, uh, conflicted. They have to be above it all. They have to be neutral and detached. So that would be an invalid warrant. Doesn't happen too often, but um, yeah, <laughs> no good faith there. That's right. Finally, facially invalid. This one actually is the number one reason that warrants get suppressed. The recklessness is the next one, and, and biased judges is almost never uh, do we see those. That's very, very rare that comes up. But uh, facially invalid is the next one. So Good faith doesn't apply if the warrant was so facially de deficient that no police officer could reasonably presume the warrant to be valid, right? So this is basically the idea here is that, look, if you got this warrant and if, if somebody on scene would have read it and they're a reasonable police officer, they're like, uh, guys, we ain't, this ain't working. OK, this ain't work. This is this is not probable cause for this guy's house. I'm not hit, I'm not hitting this house under this warrant. That's the kind of the idea there that if somebody on scene would have been like, no, this is not legit. Um, then the warrant is facially invalid and the good faith doesn't apply. So here's an example um, from the 10th Circuit where basically they uh, look, see what it see what it says here. Um, it says. The cops wanted a warrant authorizing the seizure of, quote, correspondence, correspondence, telex messages, contracts, invoices, purchase orders, shipping documents, payments, uh, payment records, export documents, packing slips, technical data, recorded notations, and other records and communications relating to the purchase, sale, and illegal exportation of materials in violation of the Arms Export Control Act and the Export Administrative Act. Here's the problem. There's a lot of violations that are going on in the uh, Arms Export Act, right? So the problem is it looks like a fishing expedition, right? I mean, you're not saying I want, I want um, you know, records and so forth about the sales of AK-47s to China or something like that. You're not saying that. You're saying I want any evidence about anything that falls under this huge law, laws, and that's the court said that was way too broad, right? Way too broad. So, um, that's just the way it is, right? Um, a lot of times, these are judgment calls. I mean, a lot of cops would probably look at that and say, okay, it seems legit to me. A judge signed off on it. So it's a judgment call, but um, the, in this case, it was held to be invalid. We conclude that the government may not rely on the good faith exception in this case, and that all evidence seized under the warrant should be suppressed. We find the warrant so facially deficient in its description of the items to be seized that the executing officers could not reasonably rely on it. The, that conclusion is reinforced by the government's conduct and the, and the circumstances of the search. This is one of those unusual cases where suppression of the evidence is appropriate to deter government misconduct. The search here exemplifies the very type of official conduct the exclusionary rule is intended to deter. So just way too broad, broad you know, we don't know exactly what the guy's doing, we want everything and everything is business records. It's just too much. An affidavit stated, I understand and conclude from the investigation carried out by me in this case and in accordance with the interview of the injured party, that PCM minor, that in apartment 2704 of there is, there is a desktop computer in which there is uh, porno, uh, porn, uh, pornographic material. So here is the problem. I didn't give you a lot of context here, but the case is involving lewd conduct with a minor. The cop is asking for, for a search warrant to search the computer for child pornography. Where is the connection? 
Now, maybe you can make that connection, but this cop did not make that connection. He is simply saying lewd conduct. They had some kind of sexual relations. I also want to search for child pornography. No information about in my training experience, people that engage in child you know, and lewd acts with minors also keep remnants of that. It's their trophies and so forth. This information is also contained on the digital devices, i.e. computers and so forth. If you would have said that, maybe you would have some a, a, a fighting chance. But the court here stated that that implying that, that there was child pornography on the computer was facially invalid and evidence suppressed. Whether you agree with it or not is fine, but here's the point. Articulate, explain to the court, right? Don't let them um, you know, explain why you want that evidence and why you think it's there. What do you guys think? So, so far, so good. I hope, guys, this is kind of a, one of those weird topics that doesn't come up too often. I hope, you know, my friends here, I hope that I'm not wasting your time. I hope that you're getting something out of it. I hope that this is contributing to your legal survival. Um, and let me know in the comments if you guys think this is worth your time, because this is a new class for us. And if you don't think it's worth it, I won't offer it again. I don't want to waste anybody's time. Maybe I'll offer something else and let me know. Okay. Warrantless criminal investigations. Okay. Good. I mean, maybe this stuff is important just as information purposes too. Okay. Now, warrantless criminal investigations are controlled by objective reasonableness, Right objective reasonableness here's the point now as i said good faith is something that comes from the outside world and tells you to do what you did okay i appreciate the feedback here this is good for me right but when you are working under criminal investigations when you're doing your own stuff when you're making your own decisions when you're internally making decisions it's not good faith. It's objective reasonableness. That's why my friend said, good faith will not save you, but bad faith will sink you. He's talking about this with criminal cases. Good faith is incompatible with objective reasonableness. Therefore, the focus is not on good faith, but on whether or not the law was clearly established at the time, right? Now, just real quick, somebody is asking me if we can put this on demand. I'm going to put it on demand. And in fact, I am thinking about also throwing it up on YouTube. So um, the YouTube channel, Rick, give them, actually, we will put it up on YouTube. How about that, Rick? We'll put it on YouTube. Rick, throw the uh, YouTube channel on there and uh, where I put videos out almost every day about cop questions and so forth. Okay. And I'm also, by the way, I'm also going to put more uh, videos on YouTube. Um, that's coming too. But check out my YouTube channel. I don't know if, if Rick is still there or if somebody else has my YouTube channel, please throw it up. There it is. Hey, Rick, thanks. All right. So good faith will not save you under object of reasonableness. This is going to be um, for criminal investigations, right? You're making the choice, right? Instead, what you need is qualified immunity. Now, that, that's under attack. My friends in New York City don't have it. My friends in Colorado don't have it. My friends in New Mexico don't have it. It's under attack in a lot of places. But qualified immunity is this idea that you should not be legally liable for things that are not clear under the Constitution. Now, if they're clear under the Constitution, then you're, you're going to be liable. So qualified immunity is, was there a constitutional violation? Yes. Okay. Well, was it clearly established? So somebody in your position know that what they were doing violated the Constitution. Here's like a, a, a weird example, right? So what happened was this lady gets arrested, but she gets pepper sprayed by police. And during the, the decon process, she's not told to remove her contact lenses, right? Now, her eyes end up burning for like, I guess, several hours, you know, while she's in the, in the holding tank. And she sues. She says that was, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, that was unconstitutional. That was excessive force, right? I'm looking at what Bradley says. Thank you, Bradley. I appreciate that. And I love the YouTube. We're trying to really build up that YouTube channel too, right? We have over a hundred videos. We're making more and more every day. So please, right? Okay. Is that 
you know, is that a, um, a constitutional violation? Well, the court found that even if it violated the Constitution, it was not clearly established under the law, right? So qualified immunity applies. That's what we're kind of talking. That's what qualified immunity is about. It's like cops should not be liable when even judges don't know if it violates the Constitution. That's the whole point. And by the way, I get on my YouTube a lot of like haters you know, of cops watch my videos and <laughs> oh, um, you know, they're like the and Mandy brought up the, the 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 qualified immunity video, which is one of my most right popular videos. And man, you should see those haters. Oh, these cops, you know, blah blah blah. So I'm just like, but they don't understand. Like, it's not to reward um, a bad cop. It's just to say cops. <laughs> cops um, have to work in very dynamic situations and they don't know sometimes what the law is. And even lawyers don't know. So why, why should you pay the price? Right. <laughs> I know somebody's like, somebody like was, by the way, like somebody was talking some smack on my YouTube channel. And I was like, you know, there's just, just, it's some of the stuff is so extreme. Right. You know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, he's like, you know, and I was like, just so you know, just because we disagree, I'm not going to erase your comments. That's I hate censorship and I'm not going to do it on my channel. Right. And he's like, thank you, blue to gold. <laughs> I was like, he was so sincere. But I was like, thank you. Like, I guess he goes on other channels and probably gets deleted his comments all the time. I'm like, no, come on, man. You want to talk smack, talk smack. Who cares? Love this country. Freedom of speech. Right. We don't have enough of it, actually. OK, pretext stops. Right. So I want to know that I want you to know that this comes up, too. Right. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> so um pretext stops now pretext stops um i bring it up in in good faith because you know good faith and you know and, and actually bad faith quite frankly are not super super relevant to pretext stops the supreme court addressed this issue in a case called ren but at the end of the day here is what we are looking for the cop could the cop stop the vehicle right could the cop stop the vehicle? And it's not, would the cop stop the vehicle? It's, could this cop stop the vehicle? Now, you have to realize that this principle was very highly contested in the 1990s, because here's the problem, okay? If cops are allowed to stop vehicles, for traffic offenses, no matter what their motive was, it opens the door to racial profiling. Because even the US Supreme Court has acknowledged that given enough time, everybody will make a traffic violation, including Supreme Court justices, right? They're driving their Escalade down the street, and they will eventually violate the law, and you will get to pull over a US Supreme Court judge. Right. So they're concerned about this and they, and they should be right. I mean, we don't, you know, 1990s was like, there's a huge, you know, um, you know, uh, issues with cops being accused of racial profiling departments, you know, New Jersey state police went through a huge uh, controversial investigation involving race, racial profiling and so forth. And uh, you can see like, even if you, you know, uh, Google some stuff about racial profiling in the 1990s, you'll see all these TV shows about it. And it is a concern, but the U.S. Supreme Court has to make a rule here, right? And it comes up in this case called Wren. So basically what happened, the, 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 the Reader's Digest version of this was that um, Wren was at a stop sign in D.C. and he's with a passenger and, you know, they're messing with something on their laps. And the cops, two uh, undercover cops uh, were watching Wren and they kind of suspected a hunch that he's maybe involved in criminal activity. And um, uh, they then want to pull over. Now, these cops are undercover. They're narcotics cops. They're not traffic enforcement. And they're looking for a reason to pull them over. And Wren makes a right turn without a signal. They light them up. They go up to the car. They see evidence in plain view, right? So when they go, when Wren goes to court, right, he can pretty much prove that the officer had a pretext. Now, pretext stops, by the way, are illegal in New Mexico. Um, so I have, I know I have a New Mexico officer here. So we, my New Mexico officer knows that. But 
Ren does not apply in New Mexico, but it applies everywhere else that I'm aware of, of the people that are on here. And, um, <laughs> yep. And um, so the, the Ren can prove that the, the cop has a pretext and here's how he does it. Number one is he asked the officer, did he violate policy when he pulled him over? And the cop's like, what do you mean? And he's like, did you pull me over in an unmarked police vehicle? He's like, yeah. Doesn't that violate DC policy? You're only supposed to uh, pull people over for uh, reckless driving and DUI in an undercover car? Yeah, that's true. And he says, when's the last time you did a traffic stop for a minor traffic offense? It's been a couple of years. And he says, um, what do you do for work? What's your assigned task? He says, narcotics. I mean, we're not stupid. We know, we know what the officer is up to, right? We're not idiots here. We don't, you know, we know that he doesn't care about the traffic violation. And the U.S. Supreme Court has to answer this. Can the cop pull this person over for that? And the U.S. Supreme Court said yes, because first of all, the stop was lawful, even though the policy said that the cop could not stop the person for reckless or you know uh, DUI. Well, the law says you can. I mean, policy does not dictate what the constitution is so yeah he might get in trouble for that you know he has to answer to his agency for that but as far as the law is concerned um that undercover vehicle was a police vehicle was an emergency vehicle owned by the government flashing forward facing red light siren number one number two he had the lawful authority to make that traffic stop he's a sworn peace officer in the district of columbia next about this whole two-year business okay so what does he have the authority? The answer is yes. Now, the Supreme Court did say that if there is objective, objective evidence that the officer was motivated for an illicit purpose, racial issues, country of origin, religion, gender, and all that kind of good stuff. In fact, the, the DOJ has 21 different prohibited um, um Fact, motivating factors for cops um, and, um, you know, the big ones and plus a, a lot of different smaller ones that may, you may, may surprise you, actually. Um, they said that that would be improper. That'd be improper profiling. So, so there is, there is illegal profiling, but there's also criminal profiling, which is okay. Now, let me show you this video as an example. Now, for, um, since I'm going to put this video on YouTube, I am just, I just kind of want to, I'm sending this message to my YouTubers in the future. I am going to erase the video from this because YouTube will give me a copyright strike because, you know, it's, it's basically fair use, but they don't look at fair use. They don't care about excuses. They care about it's a uh, live PD. And so I'm going to erase the video from the YouTube channel, but the guys here will be able to watch it. All right. All right. Let's watch it. <laughs> hey, you guys are busting this guy's uh, chops a little bit. You know what I mean? Uh, I think he was okay. This guy, this this cop is this cop is smart. I mean, he's he he, he he's. I'm sure the the bag that's in there is clean. <laughs> all right, booty sweat. That's uh something for okay. So here, first of all, for my um, for my YouTuber, my YouTubers. Okay, this is uh you can you can probably Google Live PD Warwick, Rhode Island. Um, uh. I don't, I don't know how to describe the, the rest of the video, but, you know, drugs stop. But here, here's the deal. So what we have here is a pretext stop. My, my Warwick officer had, you know, uh, you know, reason to believe that this guy's involved in narcotics. He finds a reason to stop him, which is a seatbelt, front windshield, talks to him. The guy's abnormally nervous, um, has some decoy weed. He has a little bit of marijuana, ends up getting to the car, burner phone, tear offs, um, you know, all this kind of stuff. The guy is target glancing, all this kind of stuff. We ended up doing a strip search and they found, um, they found narcotics, uh, 16 grams of fentanyl on this, on this person. So valid pretext stop, right? That's where we're at. We have a valid pretext stop. Is there any reason to believe that this officer is motivated for an illicit purpose? Yes or no? Right? There's no, there's, I guess you can say there's good faith, <laughs> right? You can say there's good faith. So good. Now, um, I thought personally that this officer, uh, <laughs> smelly good faith. I can't believe you guys give such hard time. Sought articulation. I thought for my person who is here, 
from Warwick, Rhode Island. I got to tell you that this cop, I thought, did an amazing job. So you tell him that. Do you tell this cop that I am showing his video, but I thought he did a good job. But I guess people are busting his chops about this glove issue. I think the cop was probably fine. He, he knew what he was doing. All right. <laughs> okay. Inventories, right? <laughs> you guys are uh, i tell you you can't you, you can't have a, a room full of cops without the 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 the, the, the bus and the chops all right inventory search guys before we end off i want to share with you something okay it's very very important courts want to see that inventories are not primarily conducted with a per primary purpose to finding evidence Okay, you, you know, I'm just sharing with you, this is the rule. You've got inventories got to be on the up and up. Here's why. If you have an ulterior motive, you short circuit the PC requirement. I want you to think about this. You're on a traffic stop. Okay, you're on a traffic stop. You, the guy has a suspended or expired license. He has an expired license. You want to get into the car. You want consent. He says no. You don't have probable cause to get into the car, but you have a hunch that something is in the car. And you think to yourself, aha, I can still get into the car. He has no license. I am allowed under state law to tow that car. You guys are with me on this. I'm allowed to tow that car. Is that legit? Yes or no? You tow the car because you, you want to get into it. You want to do the inventory search. But normally, if it wasn't for that hunch, you would let it go. Is that legit? Yes or no? Right. It's not legit. <laughs> it's not legit. All I got to ask you, if you say, if you think it's legit, tell the cop or tell the court the truth. Tell the court, if the court asks you, um, officer, um, what was your true intention? Oh, your honor. <laughs> Let me tell you what my true intention was. I didn't care about that license issue. You know what I mean? I'll tell you, if it wasn't for my hunch that drugs were in the car, I probably would have let it go or let him park it. What do you think about that, judge? You want to give me a pat on the back right now? Or, and this comes from um, South Dakota versus Opperman, right? So what happened here is that the cops end up inventorying this guy's car because it was getting towed for parking violations. They towed it. They found drugs inside the car. And Opperman says that, you know what? You can't search my car. You don't have probable cause, blah, blah, blah. And the Supreme Court said this. The Vermilion police were indisputably engaged in a caretaking search of a lawfully impounded automobile. The inventory was conducted only after the car had been impounded for multiple parking violations. The owner, having left his car illegally parked for an extended period and thus subject to impoundment, was not present to make other arrangements for the safekeeping of his belongings. As in Katie, Katie versus Dombrowski. It's another case from 1973 about caretaking. As in Katie, there is no suggestion, whatever, that this standard procedure was a pretext concealing an investigatory police motive. Mindset matters, okay? Mindset matters. What if you have a department policy that mandates an impound for a driver's suspended license, which removes the driver's discretion? Totally good to go. Mark, totally good to go. And I want to, I want to, yep, I want to actually explain that a little further because that's so important. I'm glad you brought that up. Here's the deal. If your primary purpose, listen, I should have maybe even be more descriptive on this because of Mark's great comment. If your primary purpose is to look for evidence and you have discretion to tow that car, and if it wasn't for that hunch, whatever you want to call it, to look for evidence, you would not tow the vehicle. Here's what I want you to do, okay? 
I want you to let it go. I will repeat, it's so important. If your primary purpose is to get into that car and you would not otherwise tow that car under the circumstances, if it wasn't for your hunch, you would let it go. I want you to let it go. If, however, you have no choice but to tow that car, it doesn't matter what you think at all, right? Doesn't matter what you think. Think whatever you want. You have to tow it. It's only when you have discretion. At the same time, don't be worried about hunches when you're doing the right thing. I mean, if you're towing a car because this guy parked his car in front of a driveway, blocking some neighbor, and you're like, that violates ordinance. These people have to go to work. And you're like, this guy's a tweaker. He's probably going to have drugs in your car. Guess what? It doesn't matter. You have to tow the car. You, you're, you're like, no, I'm going to tow this car. I'm doing the right thing here. Um, you stopped this guy three times, no license. He's, a, he's, he's probably a drug user. And you're like, no, I'm, this is done. We're no more giving you, you know, uh, uh, chances. Tow the car. It's only when you wouldn't tow the car is the problems come in, right? That's, the, that's really what's kind of going on here. An inventory search must not be undertaken for purposes of investigation and must be conducted according to the standard police procedures. However, the fact that an officer suspects that contraband may be found does not defeat an otherwise proper inventory search. So don't get scared and think that you can't have this mindset. And don't, you know, if the court asks you, you be the truthful, right? So it's not that you have no intuition. You're going to have intuition. It's just that you don't be motivated and make it, you know. So you're on a traffic stop and you have a hunch that evidence is inside the car. You don't have PC, canine, or consent. The car has expired license plate, but you would not normally you would normally not tow it. What should you do? <laughs> Goodbye, my love. <laughs> the critical point here is that inventory searches are valid only to the extent <laughs> that officers follow a standardized criteria or established routine. Officer, do you normally tow cars with expired driver's licenses? To assure that the inventory searches are not a ruse for a general rummaging in order to discover incriminating evidence, right? Guys, that is what I have for you. I'm glad you came. I hope you got something out of it, but do me a favor, Rick, throw up the, throw up the, uh, the survey and also the, uh, you're welcome, and also the YouTube. Guys, do me a favor. Also, hey, do me a favor. Coins, challenge coins and patches. We're building up our collection at headquarters. Guys, if you haven't sent it already, please, challenge coins and or your patch. Please show your pride. We want to show off your pride to your agency pride to our, to our fellow uh, employees at, um, right? Rick, throw up the, uh, the, the address again. You're so welcome. We're also, again, we're changing the format. We're going to have some more things coming up. This is what we do. When you think search and seizure, I want you to think blue to gold, right? I don't care what other people train. They have all kinds of stuff they can train. But when it comes to search and seizure, do me a favor. Think blue to gold. If you want us to train your agency, if you want us to come down, right, to your agency and train your cops, whether you want to train closed training, open training, give us a call, right? Info at blue to gold. Actually, it's training at blue to gold.com. Training at blue to gold.com. All right. My mom loves you. Look at that. My mom loves you. She's saying she's sending you best wishes. You know. <laughs> oh, AM blue to gold to the moon. Like AMC stock. I don't think AMC did well, Sonny. I appreciate that. That's that's very nice of you. <laughs>